Genesis 22 is where we're at. Genesis 22. We've been going through a series looking at heroes of the faith from the book of Hebrews. We'll get to Hebrews before we're done. But today we turn our attention to this wonderful hero of the faith named Abraham. Abraham. Did you ever go to school and there was a smart kid in the front who knew all the answers? And, and you, you kind of a little bit envious, a little bit mad at him because maybe the rest of us look bad. Abraham's kind of that guy. He really sets a high standard for his belief in God, his faith in God, and for how he serves God. And we'll see that in this chapter. But the takeaway is going to be is that we can have faith like Abraham. In fact, we can live like Abraham. Because the power was not Abraham's power, it was the power of God in his life. Today is a baptismal service. We're going to baptize four young men. And I ask God to bring the power into their life that they simply yield to what God wants them to do and yield on His strength. They live powerful lives like we're going to see with Abraham. It's possible. And by the way, Christian friend, it's possible for you to be an Abraham too. And you should be. Today we focus on Abraham. He's an important figure both in the Old Testament and the New. He's the perfect example of how to get saved. He's the perfect example of how to live once you are saved. Let's look here in Genesis 22 and verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. 
It says that God tempts Abraham. What does that mean? It means he's going to test him. He's going to see what Abraham's going to do with his life. God has already talked with Abraham. He's already promised innumerable blessing. And now he wants to see what's Abraham going to do with his life. Here comes a test. You know, God, if you are a true believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're truly born again. God is testing you. He's tempting you throughout your life. See what kind of Christian you're going to be. How will you respond? Will you respond without faith or with faith? With fear of man or fear of God? Genesis 22, verse 2. And he said, as God says to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. Okay, this is tough. He's just had this kid named Isaac. They wanted a kid their whole lives. Him and his wife, they live about a hundred years. No kid. They want a kid. They get a kid. They get Isaac. They love Isaac. And now here God's testing him, says, I want you to go sacrifice Isaac. That's a test, is it not? How would you respond? This is what I mean. Abraham sets a high bar. God tests us today. He tells us to do things today and we balk. We don't come through. This is something that Abraham loves and he's got to go sacrifice. People that have things they love, all kinds of things. Well, I love, I love my career. I could never let anything come before my career. I love my friends. I could never let anything come before my friends. I love my traditions, right? I was raised in this false gospel. I'm going to stay in this false gospel, right? Because I love it so much. We love all kinds of things. Here is the chief thing that Abraham loves. God says, are you willing to give it up? Are you willing to give it up? Watch verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Not only is Abraham willing to give up what he loves, he rises up early to do it. Man, I would have drugged my feet a little bit. I wouldn't want to do this. A lot of us, we have trouble rising up for anything that has to do with God. Isn't that true? I'm going to rise up to go to church. That's kind of early. Right? I'm going to rise up to witness to my neighbors. Let me wait a few years on that one. I'll sneak in the gospel right before they die at the very end. It'll be like an amazing hallmark moment right there. I'll sneak it in. Right? I'll start serving God when I'm, when I'm later in life and when I'm more stable. Says the person who's never become stable because they've been serving themselves instead of God. You know, when I get all my finances in order, then I'll become a giver and I'll help other people. Such people never get enough. They never have enough to give. Obeying early is an example from Abraham. Obeying early. You see, it has everything to do with what he believes. He's not some unicorn of a person that's so unique. He's just like you and I. He has something that we can have, which is faith in Almighty God. And if you have faith and strong belief in Almighty God, you can do some amazing things. Like rise up early to go kill your kid. He does, in verse 3, it says, And he saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave, wood, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. God says it. He's going to do it. No excuses. You and I could have made a bunch of other excuses. There will always be excuses to not serve God the way the Bible tells us to serve God. He doesn't make excuses. Look at verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. I don't know if his heart sunk a little bit, getting closer and closer. I don't think it did. I think he has such firm faith in God that as he approaches this thing, he has no regrets. He has no doubts that God is going to find a way through. Living life with no, with no anxiety, no fear of man. What's the world going to do if I stand up on what's true? What's going to happen to my career? What's going to happen to my reputation? How am I going to live? You're going to, you're going to give yourself... Early gray hair and an early grave worrying about this world and what it thinks of you. So many do. 
Abraham's not worried about that. Can you imagine if people got a hold of this? Boy, what kind of cult did Abraham join? He's going off to kill his kid. Which, by the way, we know is it's silly to even mention today. People do such things. But this is God telling Abraham to go kill his kid. No one in the world would have understood this. No one. He would ask his close relatives and be like, that sounds kind of cultic to me. I think you've gone over the top in your faith. Right? You get this kind of stuff all the time today. By little things like, well, I think I'm going to try to bring my kids to Sunday school. And people look at you like you've joined some sort of cult. I'm going to sing an old song in the choir. I'm going to go to a church anniversary. I'm going to go to a baptism. I'm going to say I'm a Christian. I'm going to read my Bible in the public square. I'm going to say something in the public square. That's still true. He's not worried about what people think. He's worried about what God thinks. As Christians, I hope these four young men, I hope they always worry about what God thinks and not what this world thinks. I hope they always fear God and not man. The rest of us, if we're honest, what's held us back in life? That fear of man bringeth a snare. Let's raise children that aren't afraid. Raise children. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is clean. When you fear God, everything else is easy. Everything else is easy. You know, I do thank God for the way that I was raised. I was raised in some simplicity around the Word of God. Of course, no one has a perfect upbringing. No one has perfect parents. But I was raised in such a way that if it said it on the page, it was true. And that was ingrained in me over about, you know, 18, 20 years, you know, as a young person. Ingrained that I can share my faith. So I, I turn about 30 years old and God sends us out from our uh, former church to go start a church. And I'm, I'm, th- I'm, st- I'm still young. And I start preaching right, real boldly right in the community. And other people, other Christians are joining alongside me. And I still keep saying things like, well, if it says it, then it's true. I'm going to stand on it. I've realized that other people weren't raised this way. Or other people were raised this way, but they stopped believing it. Why? Why? We feared men more than God. Across our entire nation, we feared men more than God. All of a sudden, we can't say something because it's going to offend somebody. Meanwhile, what we're doing is offending a holy God. And if you read the story of Noah, which we did just recently, eventually God says enough is enough and he sends judgment. Tell you what, when the flood came down in Noah's day, no one was afraid of men then. They were all afraid of God. Abraham rises early, he obeys. He sees it afar off. He doesn't turn back, he marches forward. Five, and Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. You see those words? Me and Isaac, we're going to go worship, and we're going to come again. This is what drives Abraham's life, his faith in Almighty God to do the impossible. Yeah, I'm going to show him to go up the hill up there, sacrifice the boy, and then we're going to come right back. Sounds like he's like making like a shopping trip or something. I'm going to go to Costco, and then we'll be right back. He's got this full confidence that God is going to keep his word, that God's promises are true. And what did God promise Abraham? He said, from thy loins, it's going to be many, many kids, as many as the stars in the heavens. Well, that's Isaac. God said, Isaac's going to have kids. And now God says, well, you've got to go kill Isaac. What does that mean? Abraham says, well, he must be, he's, going to rise, he's going to raise him from the dead. He's going to keep him alive. I'm going to obey. Today, we need faith like this. God doesn't even ask us to do this, does he? It's like, well, you know what? I want you to... I know I preach this a lot, but it's something a lot of people are struggling with. The devil has done a wonderful job of creating an economy and a nation that loves money so much. And then I do believe that the devil's in the details too, and he's in the economy, he's in, into the prices of things. And now it's so hard to make a living on one income, right? It really is. So he's got parents and Christians' parents struggling with this, with this problem of, well, you know, the Bible says that the, the parents should raise their own kids. The women should be keepers at home. These are scriptures. Yeah, I didn't make these things up. It says this is the best pattern for a home, to raise kids. 
But we can't afford it anymore, can we? It's impossible, so we can't obey God's word today. Boy, we pale in comparison to Abraham. He was ready to kill his kid thinking God would make a way through. We can't trust God with our finances. We can't trust God with our, with our homes. Instead, we give up on God's way and we try it the world's way. We fail. Things fall apart. To the point of our children, we, many of us, many people in our world, they didn't raise their kids. The daycare system did. The public schooling system did. They didn't raise their kids. And now they get those results. Because a parent is the best person to raise their kids. This is a deep one. Write this one down. A mom is the best one to be the mom. Pretty deep, isn't it? I don't have a lot of examples to put this in the shoe leather for you. But if Abraham is willing to go sacrifice his kid and see that God will make a way through, then you can serve God today. You can drop every worry you have and serve God with your whole heart. He's going to uphold your health. He's going to uphold your finances. He's going to uphold your safety. He's going to uphold everything. He will take care of you. This church is just is a very little modest example of this. God has upheld this church. I'm speaking a little bit about anniversary time, so don't think I'm trying to bring praise to our, uh, us as a group, but I thank God. Seven years ago, sent us out with, with nothing but simply faith in God's Word. And a whole lot of problems, all kinds of spiritual problems in my heart and life, sure. But a little bit of faith. And little as much when God's in it. God brings people together. Souls start getting saved from just a little bit of faith. Imagine, imagine, imagine if we had faith like Abraham. He says in verse 6, And Abraham took of the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Behold the fire... And the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Talk about a light bulb moment for Isaac here. <laughs> Something ain't adding up here, Dad. You know, I never really preach this passage from the. I always preach it from the point of view of Abraham and the wonderful example it shows to us of faith, and truly it points right to the Savior Jesus Christ. But can you imagine the indelible mark in Isaac's heart that this made? We talk about, I do anything for my kids, for the benefit of my kids. You know, the best thing you can do for your kids is to obey God. The best thing you can do is obey even in the hard things. I'm going to obey God. Even when no one else understands it, I'm going to obey God. Even when your kid might not understand it, I'm going to obey God. Heaven forbid today I see the reverse. I see little kids wanting to obey God. And the adults standing around saying, what in the world is this? you got to serve yourself. Take care of yourself. What are people going to think? How are you going to get by? Isaac, though, saw here a father that was willing to give up anything, even what he loved the most. We got dads today who love golf so much that they don't they don't give a darn about their kids or what they believe, where their hearts are at. Football or hunting or I don't know. We love a lot of stupid things. We love things more than our spouses. We love things more than our kids. We love things more than God Himself. We love things more than God's work. You know, baptism service, I love it. we got people out today, and I thank you just, just for being here, because what it shows me is there's still some people in the world who knows what is important. Oh, a young person asks Christ to be their Savior, and they want to profess it with the world? That's important. Our nation used to always think that. And I love that we see it here today. Great representation for folks that come out. But you know what? It's, it's, not, it's not the rule. People care very little about what God's doing. What do we love? Isaac saw that Abraham loved God. He didn't have any questions like, well, that means he doesn't love me. He didn't have that. You see, when you demonstrate a love for God, a commitment to God, it speaks love to everybody. Because 1 John tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. And to love others, keep my commandments. The best way you can love somebody is by obeying God. 
Look at verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. He has this undying belief. God's going to provide a way. God's going to provide a way. But he hasn't yet, has he? Watch. 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now Abraham's human. He's looking around probably. When is this lamb showing up? But until that point, you know what he's doing? Obeying God. Let's go stack the wood. Let's go get the boy up there. Let's go tie it all down. All these steps. He's faithful because he believes in God. He believes in the goodness of God. He believes in the promises of God. He believes in God's Word. Christian, where would you be in this whole Abraham example here? Would we even have gotten out of bed? Or would we have just given up at the very start? When we're looking afar off, oh great, now I've got to do this for God. Would we have already given up? I want you to think about the hard things in your life, things that you don't necessarily agree with. I mean, in your spirit. Like some people are going to die and go to hell. You need to go give the gospel to them, and you're not. Why? Like the local church is called the pillar and ground of the truth. It is. We sang a song there about the church as one foundation. Christians all together make up the church, the body of Christ. That's the invisible church. But the visible church, it's a little church like this. All around the world. Little visible churches. It's called the pillar and ground of the truth. Why haven't you been a part of one? Why aren't you serving in one? God says something is where the, this is where the truth is going to spring from. This is the ground and pillar of truth. It's like you didn't need to mark it any better. What do you need to do? Put phones up and some sirens saying, this is where you need to be in your life. Do you need to do that? That's what I'm saying. We balk. We make excuses. I can't do that. It's just too hard in my life. What am I supposed to present my body a living sacrifice? Good grief. Where are the Christians today who stop serving God? And we'll preach on it later, but I don't mean go plug into some church where you do nothing at all. The world now is filled with churches that have paid professionals, and we just sit there, listen and smile, and hope for a good time. That's called a concert. That's called an entertainment venue. Go to a church where you are the church, where you build it. And if there's already too many people doing all the building there, go build a church somewhere else. A lot of communities, a lot of cities need a church. If we had faith like Abraham, what would we do? How did he get this faith? He's putting the all together. He lays him on there. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out, called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. You want to hear from God in your life? The more we obey God, the better chance of it. He hears Abraham, Abraham, cry out. Because he took God at his word and obeyed God fully. Some people, they, they struggle to find God's hand in their life. Like, what's God's doing? You know, I asked Christ to save me years ago. and What's God doing? I've never really seen him doing anything in my life. It could be because you never rose up early and went. It could be because you backed away from the mountain you were supposed to climb. It could be because you didn't put your back to the work to start building what God wanted you to build. You haven't heard from God in decades, if ever. I'm talking to a Christian, supposedly. What is God telling you to do? The more you obey God, the more you'll hear from God. 12, and he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. That's a test. What are you withholding from God? Boy, we withhold a lot from God, don't we? America, maybe maybe it's just the American Christian, maybe it's every Christian, but we're good at just trying to partition out little parts that God can have in our lives, right? Right? He can have this little piece of me. The rest of it, that's all for me. 
There's a little part of my reputation. I'll, I'll kind of like identify you with sometimes, but I won't identify with you on the hard things. Right? Or you're going to have a little bit of my time. I'll pop into an Easter service. That's a very common thing people do. Have a little bit of my life, God. That's not what God asked for from Christians. That's not what God paid for with His blood. Amen. You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. These four young men, I love them. They profess Christ. And I've warned them, if you've trusted Christ, be warned. You are God's. Right. He is your Father. Right. Hey. He, he bought, he paid for you, Christ paid, He shed His blood to buy you. You are now a part of the family of God. You are His. If you want to live for yourself, He's going to let you know. Your purpose in life is to glorify Him. And you have all the power now with the indwelling Holy Spirit. You've got no excuses. We'll talk about that. It says in verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the, in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. The story of Abraham and Isaac is a wonderful picture of salvation, is it not? Abraham has got to sacrifice his son, a terrible thing, that death and dying, and God sends a solution in place. That's the story of Jesus Christ. Do you know this? These four young men have come to accept this. The Bible says, John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Christ died in our stead. He simply wants you to believe that. That's salvation. It's not, it's not hard. And people tell me, Logan, this gospel thing is so complicated. No, it is not. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We've all sinned and Christ died for us. Do you believe it? That's the gospel. In fact, that's what Abraham believed. I'll prove it to you. Look over here now in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 3. This sermon's going to take a little turn, a little bit of a uh, look at doctrine. But it will, it will connect with Abraham, as you'll see. Look at Galatians chapter 3, please. Why don't we have more Abrahams today? Where have they gone? Is it possible to live a life of faith? That's just one story from Abraham's long life. He lives a life full of faith. Is it possible? Can you be an Abraham? I'll tell you what. It has everything to do with what Abraham believed. How can you be an Abraham? It has everything to do with your heart. Nothing to do with your hands or your head. Everything to do with your heart. What do you believe? What kind of change would have to occur for you to be able to make that kind of sacrifice? What kind of change would have to occur for you to live for the Lord? You'd have to get born again. You'd have to be a completely new creature. For us to become anything like an Abraham, we're going to need to believe the gospel. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness... Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. We're going to meet four young men today who are of faith. Like faith is Abraham. Eight, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached be, preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. You know what Abraham believed? The gospel. God said, Abraham, from your loins is going to come a Messiah that's going to bless all people. Abraham believed in this. These four young men, they believe in the same Messiah. The same Messiah that could bless all people. They simply receive him in faith. It says in verse 9, So they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. See, nothing's changed. Sometimes people make the error of saying, well, the gospel has changed. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. It's never changed. It's always been belief in the Messiah. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? 
Have you accepted Him as your Savior? The book of Galatians makes this clear. And the book of Galatians also warns us about false gospels. You want to know how to never become an Abraham? Buy off on one of these false gospels. Let me show you what I mean. Look please at Galatians chapter 1. If you're with me in the book of Galatians, great, because we're going to stick right here for a minute, jumping from chapter to chapter. Look at Galatians chapter 1. I was praying about this sermon, and as I was praying, it started going in different directions. I trust it's what God wants, and one big part of it is to not point out the good faith that Abraham had that saved him, that made him righteous, but to point out some of these fake faiths we see in our world today. False gospels that result in false lives. Look at Galatians 1, verse 6. Paul, inspired by God, writes this. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He marveled. Paul said, I can't believe that some of these people... They've heard the gospel, and now one generation later, all right, or just a, a little bit of time later, they don't believe the gospel. I think as God looks down at our world today, I think He marvels at America that we are so soon removed from the gospel. You know, a lot of your parents and your grandparents knew what saved. If you ask them, why would you die today? So if you died today, why would you go to heaven? Excuse me? If you ask them, if you died today, why would you go to heaven? They would know the answer. They would say, because I'm trusting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They would have told you that. We ask this question more and more on doorsteps and at county fairs. If you died today, why would you go to heaven? And about 2%, I don't know, less than 5% of people know the answer. I'm talking the adults. I'm talking the kids. And that's a shame. Our nation once knew this. Today people give answers about, convoluted answers about, well, I got baptized somewhere. We're going to baptize four men today, but I ain't going to save them. That's just water. Well, I'm starting to go to church. Well, that's nice. We're going to church today, but that's going to save you. It's just a gathering. Well, I'm trying to do, I've been, I've been doing better, I'm doing good things now. No, those are filthy rags. They don't save you. You're still a sinner. But these are the answers. This is, the devil's blinded the minds in this world to believe that they can save themselves. That's a false gospel. That's a lot of what these people are going into that Paul's writing to. Look at verse 7. He says, which is not another which is to say they call it a gospel, but it's not a gospel. The gospel means good news. So if you find some faith that says, yeah, Jesus Christ is good, but then you've got to do your part, that's not good news. Because you're going to fail on your part tomorrow. I would fail on my part tomorrow. If salvation were up to me, I'd have no chance at all. We're sinners. Can't change that. Only the blood of Christ can change that. There is no other good news outside of Jesus Christ paid it all. That's the good news. One gospel for all of time. One everlasting gospel, Revelation tells us. But there be some that trouble you, trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Here's where our church has tried to stand up and say, Hey, you know, there's perverts out there perverting the gospel. Telling people that they got to save themselves. Telling people that Christ did his part, they got to do their part. That's a perverted gospel. It's perverted in the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, Jehovah Witness Church. It's perverted in churches, Methodist churches. Any church that teaches that baptism saves, that's a perverted gospel. And you say, Logan, we shouldn't call things out. We absolutely should. That's what Paul's doing here. When's the last time your church said anything remotely close to that? I'm sorry. That's what churches are supposed to do. There's one thing to get up about. It's to call out false gospels. One very prominent church in our town said that the gospel was to disciple and follow Christ for salvation. It's a lie. Watch what, watch what Paul says here. It says, 8, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
But Paul would be walking through the streets in Lewiston today saying a lot of churches and doctrines and denominations need to be accursed. He'd say there's only one gospel. It's the same thing that saved Abraham. the thing that saves people today. It's the blood of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Look at 9. And we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. He even says in verse 8, says if an angel came. So if you had an angel show up at your doorstep and tell you that, hey, Jesus loves you and the way to heaven is to follow his precepts. The way to heaven is to keep his commandments. You wouldn't believe him. That's not the gospel. The gospel is to trust Christ as your Savior. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. False gospels. Look at... Look at um, verse... Oh, there's so much good here. Look at verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You know, our church for these last seven years, we could have taken a different approach. I joke with people all the time that I'm not a smart man, but I'm, I'm a good enough actor that I could play this whole thing the other way. And I could just try to please people every single Sunday. I think I'd actually be decent at it. Just trying to find what do you want to hear? That's what I'm going to tell you. You want to hear that you can get divorced, remarried as many times as you want? I'll tell you that, right? It's not sin. Jesus never said it was adultery. He said it was cool. No, he didn't, right? Oh, you want to just live for money, right, and have the world raise your kids? Yeah, you go for it. Churches may not say this word for word, but they say this pretty, pretty close today. Jesus accepts you and your path. I affirm your decisions, not God's words. And how about the gospel? I could tell you that your, your, your Catholic aunt, right, and your Jehovah Witness cousins, and, and, and all these people are born again, but they're not because they're believing in a false gospel. So they're not born again. You love them. I love them. God loved them enough to send the Savior, but they're saying the Savior didn't save them. You need to tell them that. Do I seek to persuade men or God? Let's continue with this church, if Lord wills, another seven years of trying to please God, not man. Please look at chapter 2 in Galatians 2. The truth is, our goal isn't to tell you what you want to hear, but what God wants you to hear. And that should be true for every Christian in every church. Look at 2.21, Galatians 2.21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. When people tell you, well, you may think that Christ saves, but I don't think it's that simple, and i got to save myself. What you're saying is that Christ died for nothing. He died in vain. Please look at Galatians chapter 6. Verse 14. I take it God has us going over these passages. I think, I think somebody in this room is struggling with work salvation. Someone in this room is, is thinking that what they're doing is going to please a holy God when it's only the shed blood of Jesus Christ that satisfies a holy God. The book of Isaiah tells us that God looked down at the Son on the cross, God the Son on the cross, and He saw the travail of Christ's soul and was satisfied. That's what satisfies God. Look at Galatians 6, verse 14. It says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. You see, the cross is the only thing that satisfied God the Father. Not our works. So what should we glory in? Our works? Our denomination? We need to glory in the cross. That's what saves the blood of Jesus Christ so it washes sins away. 15. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. Beware of false gospels. Young men getting baptized today, beware of false gospels. What you believe today is not what, the mo what most of this world preaches and teaches. You need to be ministers of the true gospel that Jesus Christ is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. 
I want to share another false gospel. This one is, is, is almost as prevalent as the good works gospel that we save ourselves. I call this one the no change false gospel. You say, Logan, you're going to contradict yourself here. Well, bear with me. Look at that, even that verse that we just read. It says, a new creature. Once you get saved, you should change. Now, you're not changing to get saved, but once you get saved, you should change. So when you see somebody who says, yeah, I got Jesus, but they don't change, then you say, you didn't get Jesus. You didn't get saved. Is this making sense? This is another prevalent false idea with the gospel today. All these people going to all these churches, they hear a watered down shallow gospel, they ask Jesus into their heart, and then they stay in sin the rest of their lives. We can preach this without being confused. Please look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Now I am talking about works. Truth is, you're not saved by works. But if you get saved, then you will work for God. You'll have certain noticeable differences in your life compared to the lost person. Galatians 5, 16. People don't know what salvation is today. They don't know what saved and they don't know what saved looks like. And there's so few saved today, people can't discern the difference anymore. And there's so few Christians living for the Lord that people can't discern the difference anymore. Look, Galatians 5.16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Once you get saved by Almighty God, He gives you the Holy Spirit. And you four young men, you've got this Holy Spirit that's going to help you serve the Lord and not yourself. It's going to help you overcome sin, not stay in sin. That's what a saved person has as a new creature. That's the power. Save people will not serve sin. But watch this passage. It's important. Look at verse 17. This describes some of what a lost person looks like. 5.17, for the, lust, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now watch. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. This is naming a whole bunch of lifestyles, and I'll continue the list, I will. A whole bunch of lifestyles that show the person doesn't know Christ. Because their flesh is still beating them up. The flesh is pummeling them. They have not changed at all. They're still an adulterer. They're still with somebody who is not their spouse or with somebody else's spouse. They're still a fornicator. Uncleanness and lasciviousness, that does speak to the sins of sodomy in Scripture. It does. So people today, though, they say that they're saved while they live in these works of the flesh. I'm telling you from Scripture, it can't be true. It can't be true. People get saved will be a new creature. This no change gospel is a lie. The gospel will change you. Look at verse 20. Idolatry. You say, well, Logan, I know my Catholic friend is actually born again. Well, they're still genuflecting at the feet of the statue of Mary there. That's called idolatry. If they were saved, and they, they can get saved just like I did, just like you did. But if they were saved, they would get away from that sin. They would become a new creature. This isn't a new concept. This is what the Bible says. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness. My wife and I heard all these sirens last night, middle of the night. We're wondering what was all this commotion about. Apparently it was some fight down at a bar. Drunkenness. It's not, it does not typify someone who's been born again. It's a sign that they're lost, revelings and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible says that those people who live those ways, it's apparent that they're not saved. They're not born again. 
This simple truth right here is enough for our church to stand out a little bit. All the other churches are trying to convince people, if you live however you want, we know you're saved. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Everyone's a sinner. Well, this tells us you can know people by their fruits, which is exactly what Christ told us. Christ told us to be fruit inspectors. Saved people will have works. Not to get saved, but because they are saved. It's that fruit analogy. Remember Christ told us in Matthew 7, 20, verse 21, it says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Jesus said there's a lot of people saying, Lord, Lord, and they're lost. How about you? Jesus gave us that fruit analogy. A fruit tree will bear fruit. Not to become a fruit tree, but because it is a fruit tree. A Christian will bear fruit. Are you bearing fruit? If you're not bearing spiritual fruit in your life, I just want it to, as a huge light bulb go off in your head, you're lost. If you were to stand before Christ today, He'd say, depart from me, for I never knew you. The church is doing a disservice to people today by affirming them as being saved when their fruits completely say the opposite. Do you understand what I mean? So these four young men... We'll baptize them today because that's the pattern in Acts. Philip asked the man, or the man said, What must, or can I be baptized? And Philip said, You believe with all thine heart thou mayest. So he baptized them. But what if in 10 years we see fruits in these young men's lives? They're just living in sins like drunkenness or fornication. I'm going to say, Boy, it didn't look like that, that. Those guys really got saved. I pray that's not the case. I pray with sincere hearts these young men have asked Christ to save them. And you know what? If they did, they're saved. And you'll see the Spirit working in their lives. But we got to get real about Christ and the change that comes with salvation. If there's no change, there's no salvation. I'll be the unpopular guy that still says that's the case. You've got people in your family who you ask them, do you love Jesus? They say, yeah. They haven't served Him a day in their life. They haven't proclaimed Him a day in their life. They've served sin through and through. Stop playing a game. You need to get the gospel to them. Or you need to believe the gospel yourself. Please look at James chapter 2. This might be the strangest combination of scriptures you've ever seen. But I am a person who believes that theology shouldn't be limited just to one section. Don't build theology out of one little passage. It's got to match everything in Scripture. So the Bible, through and through, Romans, Galatians, Isaiah, tells us that we're not saved by our works. Then James comes along and gives us this passage on works. Let's study it closely. We are winding down the sermon, I promise. We'll get to that baptism. I know a lot of you are here ready to celebrate that. James chapter 2. It mentions our friend Abraham again. Watch this. This passage can preach and it can convict if you're willing to let the Scriptures convict you. I feel my job is both to convince you that Jesus Christ is the Savior. I must, from Scripture, try to persuade you. And I thank God for this opportunity to do so. At the same time, I feel compelled by the power of God to try to persuade you to consider yourself as lost, if that's what the evidence suggests. Are you lost or are you saved? If you die today, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? James chapter 2, look at verse 24. He gives us an important line that helps us understand more of the text around it. 24 says, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. James chapter 2 speaks from the point of view of what we see. You know, God sees hearts. God right now knows for a fact whether our friend Dylan truly believed in his heart. God knows, and I believe, I believe Dylan does believe. 
But we, we only see with our eyes. So we'll see lives over the next years. We'll see what works. That's what this is talking about in James is what we see. What we see. Faith in your heart shows God you believe. Faith in your works shows us that you believe. Look at verse 17. It says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. There are so many people today that say, Oh yeah, I'm a man of faith. I'm a man of faith. Never got my kids to church. Never shared the gospel with anyone. But I'm a man of faith. No, you're not. You're a fake. You're a fraud. Faith without works is dead being alone. It's a dead faith. You never got it. You never got born again. You never got alive on the inside when the Spirit of God by the wash in the blood. Faith without works is dead. There are a lot of people who say they're a man of faith and they're dead. Look at verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show thee my faith. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show thee my faith by my works. I hope you see my faith. I hope you see the faith of those around you. I hope today you see the faith of these four men we're going to baptize. You know what that what baptism is? It's proclaiming. I believe this. I believe this. I believe this. If you really believe, why haven't you proclaimed that? Or why just leave off proclaiming that decades ago? We believe, therefore we speak. That should be your life through and through. Look at 19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Some people say, well, of course, I believe in God. That's Yeah, I believe in God. The devils believe in God. Big whoop. You're not saved by a belief in a higher power. You ask people today, you know, are you, are you, are, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm, I'm religious. I got a Christmas tree. You know, my parents were religious. I get that so often. Yeah, my parents were religious. Well, I'm not asking about your parents. I'm asking about you. Did you get born again? The devils also believe and tremble. Look at 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man? You think I'm rough? The scriptures are rough. This is telling you, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Now, can you receive this? We're not saved by works. I've said that through and through. But if you have no works like a Christian would have, you need to ask yourself right now, this morning, are you born again? Why haven't you been living like an Abraham? Why haven't you making some hard decisions to stand up for truth? Why haven't you been sharing, proclaiming Christ? Why do you always take the easy way, the worldly way? Why always fear men instead of God? Why are you always interested in pleasing men, not God? Why are you always interested in serving yourself and not God? To look at 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works his faith was made perfect? We know who Abraham was by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Do you have a dead faith or real faith? To close, Hebrews 11. This time instead of starting in Hebrews 11, we'll close right here and we'll go to our baptism. Hebrews 11. Lord. Hebrews 11 and verse 8. Christian friend, I challenge you with some of these verses now because this tells us a lot of the works that Abraham had, the life that he lived. Hebrews 11 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should... After receive, which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Christian friends, saved people, they obey. The Bible says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Look at verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. It says, it says that he sojourned, that means to stay somewhere. He stayed. Saved people stay. They find where God wants them and they serve faithfully. 
They don't just pop in and out now and then. The Bible says, Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Look at verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundation to build her and make her as God. Saved people are interested in what God is building. Do you have that interest? Or are you interested in what you're going to build later on today? What you will make? If you have no interest in what God is building, are you saved? Have you advanced God's work in this life, in this world, or just your own? The truth is, unsaved people don't care what God's building. They're bu- busy building their own businesses, their own reputations, busy building toward their own futures. They don't care what God's building in little hearts and minds, what God's building in a community. Look at verse 11, please. Through faith also Sarah received strength. Strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Saved people do hard things. Sarah had courage in her old age to have the son. Saved people do hard things. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Folks get baptized today. And by the way, this is leading right to our baptism. This is our baptism charge as well. But young men getting saved today, you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. And I want to tell you, that verse is not owned by the football player catching a football or the baseball player or the basketball player. That verse is owned by Christians running the Christian race. You can have the strength to serve God. That verse is for the person serving the Lord, proclaiming the Lord, obeying the Bible. That's what that verse is for. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Verse 12, therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and the multitude, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, innumerable. These blessings, saved people are blessed beyond measure. Look at 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. That sounds like a Christian to me. Christian people, saved people, are, pers- are persuaded by God's word. Are you persuaded today? You can say, no, Logan, you weren't persuasive enough. Well, it's not about me, it's about God's word. If this Bible hasn't persuaded you yet, it's because you're willingly ignorant. The Bible says that Agrippa told Paul, he says, that almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost persuaded isn't good enough. And almost persuaded is one step near the grave. You need to be persuaded that the Bible is true and that Christ saved you. Shed His blood for you. It says embraced. They embraced them. Have you embraced God's word? You know, Job says that he, he um, esteemed the words of God's mouth more than his necessary food. Do you love this Bible? You four young men, you're going to need to love this Bible. This is how you're going to eat. This is how you're going to nourish your soul. When all the world around you is starving and people don't know how to help you, God's word is what will help you. It says they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. By getting baptized this morning, you're saying, okay, I'm one of them. I'm a stranger on this earth. I don't fit in. I'm not the same as everyone on my basketball team. I'm not the same as everyone at my school. I'm not the same as everyone in my neighborhood. I'm different. I'm now part of the family of God. And my job is to share Christ with this world. Confess and profess God's word. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Look at verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Christian friends and you four young men, Get the world out of your mind. The devil all along your life is going to want to give you opportunity to return, to sink back into the world, just to live for sin instead of for God. The devil's always going to tempt you in those ways. Don't look back. That was, remember Lot's wife? She got longing for the world. She lost it all. Don't look back. Don't turn back. You've got a wonderful life to serve the Lord. You've got a wonderful purpose. Four young men. Four young men, these guys could be preachers. 
if God calls them. Faithful servants somewhere, lighthouse in whatever community they live in. I pray for that. 16, but now they desire a better country, that is to say, in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Boy, those are convicting words, aren't they? God's not ashamed to be called these people's gods. He wasn't ashamed to be called Abraham's God. Is he ashamed to be called your God? Those are convicting words. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. They're still talking about that story, what Abraham did, the faith that he had. I'll close with this. It says there that Isaac was Abraham's only begotten son. So Isaac, too, is a picture of that Savior, Jesus Christ. Two verses. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We had the pleasure of sharing that verse with thousands of young people at the county fair. I believe this young man was one that heard that verse probably over and over, year after year. Friends, more people need saved. More young men need to come to the Lord. More young women And if we have to reach the adults through the kids, then so be it. So be it. Pray that God raises up more witnesses, faithful witnesses, and pray for these four young men that they are just that. And I make this as a special prayer. May these four young men always be preachers who preach the full counsel of God. The last verse I will share is John 3.36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Those are the stakes. God is a wonderful, loving God. He paid for salvation full and free in the blood of Jesus Christ. These four young men have chosen to believe that. Have you? It's all up to you. I'm going to pray. If I could ask the four young men to go ahead now and begin to prepare, um, getting into their... um, Oh, get a picture? Oh, we could. We could. Well, we'll, let's do it after the service. We'll get it all together afterwards, okay? You four young men, go ahead and, and get ready in your clothes, and I will pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to preach the gospel, Lord. Forgive me for all my faults and my insufficiency, Lord, but I know your Bible is sufficient, and I know, Lord, we read plenty of it this morning. Lord, I pray for hearts in this room tonight. If there's someone, Lord, who hasn't accepted Christ as these young men have, that they will right now. I pray that that you would bless it, Lord, as Brother Brett's going to come forward. Lord, we'll sing. Lord, we won't have an altar call, but Lord, I pray on the altar of people's hearts that they would make decisions for you. To accept Christ their Savior, Lord, then to serve you as they haven't before. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Brother Brett, would you please lead in some singing? I'll get prepared and we'll go right to the baptism, okay? Quincy James, upon your profession, or your notice, find profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Norman Patrick Riddle, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, we got Marcus, Alicia, Guzman. On your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and I'll baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Wyatt Biggie, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and I'll baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.